Tonight on Rescue 911, these true stories of extreme adversity and overwhelming love. It's basically a balancing act on the, on the terrain. You really have to keep aware and look out in front of you to know what's coming up. When you hear that someone is turning blue, you know that you're into those very critical three to five golden minutes. We were going to be outside that envelope by the time the fire engine could get up there. We had the heart monitor in place, and we observed what looked to be ventricular fibrillation. Having a 13 or 14-year-old child going into cardiac arrest, that's a whole different ballgame. At any moment, any one of us might be called upon to try to change the course of events. We begin in Texas City, Texas on April 10th, 1994, where Candy and Arnold Sanchez had come with their family, expecting to spend a relaxing day at the beach. How are you guys feeling? Are you hungry? Are you hungry, baby? How about you, Are you hungry? Since it was windy, my brother had tied the float to the truck so that the wind wouldn't take it. You guys eat all your lunch. Then he said, the float, no one touch it. So we knew, everybody knew not to touch it. Where are the tortillas? I didn't bring tortillas. Por qué no, amiga? Tortillas are those bologna sandwiches, Ralph. I had told my son, little Arnold, and Martin, my nephew, that I'll go into the water because I don't know how to swim. Arnold Jr. is very nice. We like to build puzzles a lot, and we like to play basketball. I feel bad because we probably had no business going in the water without permission. I heard Martin yell, help. <gasps> oh, my God. And I looked toward the water. I saw Martin and Arnold floating. Just stay right there. I'm coming to get you. Go get Arnold. Go get Arnold. My reaction was, I'm going to get those boys. They're going to get a whipping. They're going to not be able to watch cartoons for a long time because they were told to leave the raft alone. I really thought I was going to be able to get to them. Martin had gotten scared because I had said that I was going to spank them. He jumped out. Martin! Martin, hold on! Martin! Martin's drowning, so I went for him first. And Arnold was crying. He said, are you not going to help me, Mommy? And I said, Arnold, stay there. We're going to get help. Arnold Sr. tried to swim out to his son. I took off at an angle. I figured I could swim out and catch him before he went too far. He had drifted much further, and he can't swim at all. He didn't even have a life check. <laughs> What was going through my mind was that I wasn't going to reach him. I knew I couldn't. It was real hard because I watched my son just float away from me. Six-year-old Arnold Sanchez Jr. was being swept out to sea on a small rubber raft by swift currents. His father, Arnold Sr., did his best to swim out and catch him, knowing his boy could not swim. It seemed like the closer I tried to get, the further he was getting. He was reaching out his hands, crying, calling for me to go get him, and we couldn't reach him. 
Arnold's uncle managed to flag down Joel Herrera, who was driving by with his boat. He was very excited, and he said, my little boy is out in the water. I looked out into the bay and saw that the boy was headed out there. It was very windy that day, and you could hear him screaming. He was scared. I couldn't swim anymore. I had no more power. If I lost him, I couldn't live with myself. At that time, I just said, God, please take over my son and watch him. What's wrong? Joel's brother-in-law, John Matthews, also came over to help. That boat was jammed in reverse, so you know, I went out to the boat to see what the problem was. I really didn't think it was that bad yet. I thought, as long as he's in the raft, he's OK. Oh my God. Finally, the wind had gotten so great that it overturned the raft, and the boy went down. You could tell he was struggling to stay up until he couldn't anymore. And he went down. I could hear people in the background saying, he's gone, he's dead. I thought I lost my son. When I couldn't see his hands anymore, I thought that was the end of the world, all right? Turn me around, turn me around. I knew we had a really bad situation. I quit messing with the motor and decided to go ahead, go with reverse. Reverse is better than not going at all. I could hear my husband say, God, don't take my only son. I love him. I can't lose him this way. That time my husband just grabbed me. We just held on to each other. All I seen was the raft tumbling across the water. I didn't see the child. The things that were going through my mind was they're going to get rescue divers out here to catch the body or whatever, because I knew we weren't going to find him. My heart sped up. I just thought of the worst, that he was gone, but I didn't give up the hope that we may have the chance to find him. And just kept searching the water. It was more or less like trying to find a needle in a haystack. There he is. Go for it. I've never pulled a dead person out of the water, but now I know what it feels like. Just a limp, wet body. And that's, that's all it was. I got him. I got him. I got him. Hang on there, buddy. It was like a dish rag when he handed him to me. There was no life in the little boy's okay. body at all. I didn't think they were going to find him. But God was with us that day, because he brought my son up from that water. There was no pulse, and he was foaming real bad, so I turned him over to get the water out. Then I started to give him the CPR. Since the boy was so small, I blew into his mouth and nose. On the third try, he took a deep breath, just a big <sighs> And I thought maybe I had a chance. EMT Shane Martin with the Texas City Fire Department took over the boy's care. Anytime in a near drowning, you're worried about brain damage from being under too long. It was obvious he had water in his lungs because of the lung sounds. What we needed is to fly him out as soon as possible. So we made a decision to have the Coast Guard chopper land and fly the boy out. Six-year-old Arnold Sanchez was taken by Coast Guard helicopter to the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, where Michael Hurd was the head nurse on duty. Arnold, 
He was extremely combative, so he was without oxygen to his brain for some time. He did have some sounds that indicated that he had fluid of some sort in his lungs, and that can only get worse if we don't pay attention to it. Mr. and Mrs. Sanchez, please come in. I'm Dr. Barrett. How are you? I wanted him to look at me and say, Mommy, don't worry. I'm going to be all right. But he couldn't. If God chose him to be brain damaged or paralyzed, I was going to be able to accept it, just as long as he didn't die. The following morning, Arnold regained consciousness. How are you feeling? I was so happy. He said, Mommy, I want to go home. Doctors told him, can you walk? He says, if you let me, I'll walk. He's a very lucky young man. The bystanders that found him in the water and started CPR initially on him is probably the single most thing that saved his life. Arnold, the man. He saved you. Good see you again. Arnold has completely recovered from his near drowning. Never met you. Yeah, never. Thank you. No, you no saved problem. my baby's life. Oh, Joel's the one who saved his life. I don't like to think that we were the only ones that could have done that. If someone else would have had a boat out there, they would have done the same thing. That yeah, was just an accident and it happened. I just feel like I'm a lucky person right. that just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You know, there's nothing heroic about what I did. I owe y'all my life. I felt like I had done a good deed. We I felt like I had returned a favor because I had an accident earlier and I got a second chance at life. And I felt like we were here, that boy's guardian angels that day. We were able to retrieve him and give him a second chance at life. Yeah. <laughs> Next time I go to beach, I wear a life jacket. You got it. I want to learn how to swim. That way, when I'm in the high water, I don't have to drown. If you're going to take your kid to the beach, teach them to swim. Teach them to dog paddle. Teach them to float on their backs. If you can teach them to stay calm and stay afloat, you know, that's a big plus. <laughs> it just takes seconds for something to happen. So it's your duty as a parent to keep an eye on your yeah. kids. And I also learned that my family need to take classes for CPR because if my husband or I would have been able to pull my son out, we wouldn't have known what to do next. Don't give up! If it wasn't for those men, I wouldn't have my son right now. I love them. I think I owe them my life. <laughs> On May 2nd, 1993, Roland and Barbara Scott and their son Andrew were being visited by Barbara's mother at their home in Concord, Massachusetts. She came to help out in any way she could while three-year-old Andrew was having surgery. But none of them ever imagined just how much they would rely on her during her stay. Daddy, I'm hungry. You hungry? Okay. Andrew was supposed to go into the hospital for an operation that week uh, to widen his trachea. Would you like some corn? Get some corn for you. Okay. Let's see. Hurry up, I'm hungry. He would seem all excited about it. Yeah, yeah, corn, great. Andrew? Andrew? Andrew, breathe. Cough. Come on, let it out. Andrew! Concord 911, this call. We got a baby that's choking. It's What's your... He's turning blue. What's your address? 157 Mill Road, Concord. He's turning blue, please. Okay, we'll be right there. Does anyone there know how to do CPR, ma'am? No, no. Okay, stay with me on the phone, okay? All right, hurry, please. He's turning blue. Please, he's turning blue. He's turning blue. We're on the way, ma'am. He's choking. He's choking. What's the baby choking on, ma'am? He, he ate some corn. Okay, and it's caught in the baby's throat? Yes, yes. Okay. Concord Police Dispatcher Philip Smith is handling the call. When you hear that someone is turning blue, you know that you're into those very critical three to five golden minutes. 
knowing the location of the house, we were going to be outside that envelope by the time the fire engine could get up there. Okay, please, not breathe. Okay, okay, where's the baby right now, ma'am? He's on the floor in the living room. We're trying to... I got down beside him and tried to blow into him, and I realized that I couldn't blow in at all. You know, it was completely blocked. It really is the mother's worst nightmare, that feeling that Andrew's life was slipping away from us and we couldn't do anything about it. Okay, is the baby breathing at all, ma'am? No, is he breathing? No! He's not breathing, no! We had uh, just instituted the medical priority dispatch card system, so it basically came down on me that if I didn't pull this one off, that uh, we were in very, very deep trouble and um, we might not make it. So how old's the baby, ma'am? He's three years old. Three years old? Yeah. Okay, I want you to lay the child on the floor, face up. Can you do that? Yeah, his father's doing that. Right? All of a sudden, he just seemed to be dead. And um, I don't know what I'd do without him. Here's what I want you to do. Yes. Okay, I want you to straddle the child. Straddle the child. Straddle Sit him. Sit right over the child. Andrew's grandmother, Dolores Plascota, had just arrived six hours earlier. At this point... We thought that he was gone, that he was not going to come back to us. Just put the heel of one hand on the child's stomach. Put, just the, heel, put the heel of your hand, one hand on his stomach, Roman. Just, just above his belly button. Just above his what? Okay, does okay. you understand me? Yes. Okay, what I want you to do is push push down six times. Can push you do that? Roland, push down six times. There. Six. Okay, he's coming too. The baby's coming too? Yeah, he's sitting it up. Is the baby breathing or crying? Is he breathing? No, he's not breathing, but he spit it up. 4650, the fire chair. Yeah, the baby is not breathing? No. Okay, you're going to have to do it again, ma'am. Do it again, Roland. Do it again. Six more times. Six more times, Roland. 44. Six more times. I was like, oh my God, we've tried everything now. And it was uh, just so, you know, frightening that, it, you know, I just wanted to believe that we could bring him back. Infant choking, code red. Okay, six more times. Did that do anything, ma'am? Did it help? It helped. It helped a little bit. Okay. The, all right. Is the baby breathing? Is he breathing? He's breathing. Yeah, he's crying. He's starting to cry. Okay. When his eyes opened up first, his first breath in was just a little breath, like it was going through a straw. It was so scary, but it was like he was like he was alive, you know. Let him cry, Roland. That's good. The joy of hearing that cry was wonderful. He was back with us. We were happy. Okay, they're they're all here. Okay, they're in the room there with the yes, child? Yes. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Six bye. minutes after the call began, the first rescue units arrived. Once the paramedics arrived, and especially once I heard the child coughing in the background there, I knew that, uh, I knew that we had made it. You don't like crashing? It was never conclusively determined whether Andrew's narrow trachea was the reason he choked that day. His surgery was successfully performed one month later. We're very lucky. Very lucky. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's you know, I think, well, what if we lived in a town where they didn't have 911? Or, you know, what if we had it, but... The dispatchers hadn't been given that training, and all they could do was call the ambulance, and the ambulance took 11 minutes. You know, they might have revived Andrew, but he might not have been the same person. That was a red flag, too. I feel very fortunate that, that Phil was on the other end of the line to answer the phone, and I love him for, for bringing my son back. Recently, the whole family visited the fire department to personally thank dispatcher Philip Smith. I will remember this call for the rest of my life and for the dramatic results that came out of it, especially uh, truly one of the, the finest moments I've had here. Remember that, Andrew. I want the officer at 911 to know we will never forget him. I thought of him especially when Andrew had his fourth birthday. And I thought he might not have had a fourth birthday 
if it hadn't been for 911. That's your side of the road. Uh, the grandmother did an absolutely astounding job. Once she started taking directions, she conveyed them perfectly. They were executed and uh, worked out great. See, there's some tracks over there. May you look through this tree. It's everything that we have him with us to love and to watch him grow. Give me a kiss. Yeah. Oh, is that good? Oh. For some people, the thrill of a sport involves pushing yourself to the limit. On February 13th, 1994, a group of friends with a wide range of mountain biking experience were spending their Sunday afternoon riding together in a rugged and remote area near Blackwell, Texas. The ranch is 4,600 acres of rolling terrain, buttes, washes. Every time it rains, it changes. Sometimes it's hard packed, a lot of times it's washed and rolling rocks, which makes it very difficult. It's basically a balancing act on the, on the terrain, and you uh, kind of have to let your bike float underneath you. You really have to keep aware and look out in front of you to know what's coming up. Don Eichels rode in the center of the pack. The four experienced mountain bikers, other than myself, rode ahead of us, and I more or less wanted to hang back with the three less experienced guys because if you're going into an isolated area and one that's very technical, you don't want to be riding by yourself. Nancy Harvey was concerned that her husband, Stan Kent, had gone on this ride. The group Stan was biking with were people who had been doing this type of biking for years, and he had done it for two months. He was taking risks that would be dangerous to someone who really hasn't been doing it for a long time. Stan's friend, Richard Brown, was also a less experienced mountain biker. Stan was in front of me that day, so I stayed back. I know my limitations. At times, I have a tendency to, to fall. And I wouldn't want to fall in front of someone and cause him to fall. Ski drop! Gary Fraser was one of the most experienced riders in the group. The top is rocky and rough, and it kind of levels out and fools you because you pick up a little bit of speed, and then it drops off. Towards the bottom of it, it gets more washed out. So if you've gone with too much speed into the bottom of the hill, you have a lot of difficulty slowing down for the turn. Think you can make it? Yeah. Okay. Just be careful. It was uh, a real uneasy feeling for me because Stan and I were pretty close friends and uh, we kind of watch out for each other when we're biking. We kept talking to Stan and asking if he was okay and he kept coming back to us saying that no, I'm not okay, I'm in a lot of pain. Are your legs okay? You, you we realized that we need to get more help in there than what we had. You two guys go on out and get some help. You guys stay together, okay? I'm a uh, scoutmaster for the Boy Scout Troop. 
And that's basically where a lot of my first aid experience and uh, training comes from. When a, there's a serious injury, you don't wait for the symptoms of shock. You, know, you automatically go ahead and treat for shock. Stan, we want you to keep your body as still as possible. Just let them move you, okay? If he had sustained a back or neck injury, the only thing you could do is make it worse if you, you know, jarred him or made any sudden movements with him. Let's try to brace his neck a little bit. Let's see if a good let's idea. Use our camelbacks. We were going to make it impossible for him to purposely move his head. And what we decided to do is to cushion the sides of his head and then push boulders so that it would at least stabilize him until we got uh, experienced rescue personnel there. Within 10 minutes, the two mountain bikers got back to the head of the trail, where they happened to find an off-duty EMT. Uh, no. We got a guy that's hurt real bad back in there on Telegraph Hill. While the other four bicyclists searched for a road that could be used to bring in a rescue vehicle, Gary stayed with Stan. I never met this guy before, and I was making conversation, just trying to keep his mind off of where he was at. Uh, originally, I'm from New York. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What brings you to Once in a while, he would wince, and he'd complain about a sharp pain, and I felt uh, helpless, I, that I couldn't do any more for him. When EMT Junior Kennick got to the scene, he quickly assessed Stan's condition. He told me that his neck hurt and his back hurt, and uh, I realized there was a real good chance that he had spinal injury. He was in severe danger because if he sneezed or anything, he could have paralyzed himself. Gary and Junior returned to the trailhead in search of first aid equipment. We were trying to find something we could use for a backbone. Yeah, that'll work. This is a good old work. It was ideal, so we got some screwdrivers and pretty much yanked it out of the wall. One, two, two three. Real easy. They all seemed to be knowledgeable in some first date, so I figured they would be able to do as I asked because it might be at least an hour before we had an ambulance on the scene. <laughs> I was just encouraging him, but I knew that he was worried about his wife, Nancy, and he was worried about what was going to happen to his life because uh, an accident like this, you know, could change a person's life forever. Nice and slow, guys. So I'm going to keep level. The sooner that he can get treatment in the hospital, the better off he'll be. Stand the big boy. <laughs> When the Blackwell Volunteer Rescue Unit, including EMT Marsha Harris, reached the ranch, they had to drive the ambulance cross-country to get near the scene. We had to leave the road and just go out into pasture. We drug bought them going through and didn't know if we'd be able to get out of there or not. Once we get more people in the back of that ambulance. Careful of rocks, it's slippery. I looked right. up and couldn't believe that the, uh, the ambulance was pulling in there. I don't know how they ever got that thing back in there. But everything was working out to Stan's favor. Put him down right over here, guys. Right. Fire Chief Will Lenore took charge of Stan's care. I knew that someone in this group had some medical training by looking at the way they had him packaged. I had a, uh, a lot of admiration for what these guys had done. He had the tingling sensation in the fingers and four fingers on the other hand that were hurting him very bad. But observing the fingers, there was no injury. Signs that he very well did have serious injuries to the neck. I'll get this back. We've got a patient that has feeling in all four extremities. He's moving all four extremities. But one wrong move, and you've got a patient with a lifetime of immobility or immortality. 44-year-old Stan Kent was taken to the emergency department of Shannon Medical Center and put under the care of neurosurgeon Robert Legrand, Jr. Another good hard squeeze here on the right side. Let's see the next one. And the next one. There are seven vertebrae in the neck, and the first two 
were fractured and there was a slight dislocation of the second one. No question about it. And there's that... An injury to that location can cause death because it can cut off breathing, it can cut off the heartbeat, and it can cause total paralysis. Fracture going all the way through the pedicles in the body. Stan could have died if he had not been treated appropriately at the scene of the accident. A friend drove Nancy to the hospital to be with her husband as soon as she was notified of the accident. I didn't know if I'd find him all torn up or what it was that was wrong, but I figured, right. knowing right. Stan, it was probably something fairly serious. Stan? Yeah. I'm here. How are you? Did they tell you what... Did they tell you what I did? No, other than fell off your bike. Oh, I broke my neck. He was in the best hands he could be in. Um, okay. He was able to move his fingers and his toes, and so I knew there was really no major neurological damage to him. And then I was also a little bit uh, angry with him because I'd been warning him frequently about how dangerous it was and to be careful. I really messed up this time. Yeah. I'll work with it. His bike helmet sustained considerable damage, and it was quite obvious to me that it prevented a more serious head injury, and I think it prevented a more serious spinal and spinal cord injury. Gonna take some getting used to it. I can see that. The halo was uh, an adjustment. Okay. I had to learn to walk again. You feel top heavy. Uh, you're afraid to stand up. You're afraid to walk around. And it was hard to learn that I will not be able to run or bike for uh, six months to a year from the time the accident happened. Come on. In the five months since the incident, Stan has been slowly healing. He doesn't take any risks now because he realizes how serious it is. Get these spots on his neck. He was playing with the boys out in the pasture, playing rough. I had never been down that trail before, and I didn't know what to expect. I should have stopped and got off and walked down the hill. I needed to ease into mountain biking, and I went a little too fast. Up straight, shoulders back. What saved him was having the right people there who knew what to do and the right circumstances. A friend of mine said he is the most unlucky, lucky person she's ever met. He looks good. Everybody that was there on that day was a hero. It probably didn't look real serious, but everybody assumed it was, and that saved my life. I lived through this accident. Years ago, I had a type of pneumonia that's been nicknamed Legionnaire's disease, and I lived through that. So I feel lucky and I feel fortunate if cats have nine lives, I've already used up two of mine. <laughs> In Maple Heights, Ohio, as 1993 approached, Terry Lynn Smith was trying to cope with the difficult breakup of her marriage. But she had set aside the morning of December 5th, 1992, to watch her older daughter, 14-year-old Nikki, March in the local Winterfest parade. Nikki was my quiet child. She's always there for people, but she stayed to herself. She had asthma since she was five, and when she's doing a lot of activities, it flares up. And I kept saying, March with your friend, but just don't blow the instrument. She said, okay, mommy, I won't promise I won't blow the instrument. I'll pretend like I'm playing and all this. Okay, Nikki, just do that. They had never had a Christmas parade, and she wanted to do it. She was happy, but you can't tell when Nikki, when she's upset, you know. friend, Cherise Ray, was also marching in the band. Everything seemed to be normal until we got to the middle of the parade. She started gasping. She would wave her hand and say she was okay and stuff, but she wouldn't stop. You okay? You stop I seen her grab her chest, and that's when I screamed for Mr. Chamberlain. Assistant band director Nick Pewin 
was a few rows behind Nikki. And the band director yelled back to me that Nikki was having trouble breathing. And we knew that she wasn't an asthmatic, and I thought, she'll be okay. I've seen this happen before. I saw this truck nearby, and I thought, maybe if we get her inside, it might be warm inside, and she can breathe better. Okay. That's when she collapsed. Okay, come on. Oh, Mrs. Brickley, help me. Oh, oh. I started to get pretty scared there because she was not moving at all. It was just dead weight. Firefighter paramedic Bill Wheeler had pulled the antique fire truck he was driving off the parade route when he saw Nikki was in trouble. The band director asked if we could contact the rescue squad because the girl was having a bad asthma attack. And at that time, she collapsed again by the running board. She was gasping for air, and she wasn't responding at all to me. I saw the band, and then I kept, like, you know, you're looking for your daughter, and I kept, like, where's Nikki? Where's Nikki? And then all of a sudden, three girls ran up to me. They go, Nikki had an asthma attack. She's in the ambulance. We immediately placed her on oxygen, and she started coming around, which we were glad to see that. She was kind of droggy a little bit, but I mean, she was responding to us and trying to talk to us. Uh, we knew then, well, at least the airway so far is intact, which is what we wanted. Here's your bloods. Good. When I got to the ambulance, she was just sitting there. And I talked to her, I said, Nikki, are you okay? And she just kept nodding her head. And then she made a comment talking about, tell grandma I'm okay. And I said, okay. You know, that made me feel good. I said, okay, she's fine. She just needs to get to the hospital. They're going to do what they always do to her when she has an asthma attack. She was coming around, and things seemed to be going good. All right, sir. Let's get in. Thanks. I remember just finishing up packing up our stuff there and getting ready to leave. The marching band had looks like maybe an asthma attack. Seems to be okay. We got everything done on her, so. And then suddenly the squad doors opened and sure. Billy yelled for me to come back in. She's having a seizure. That last about a minute or so, but it was pretty, pretty rough. But at that point, I was thinking maybe the brain's depleted of oxygen. We had the heart monitor in place, and we observed what looked to be ventricular fibrillation. It's a lethal rhythm. Instead of the heart beating, all it's doing is actually quivering. Having a 13 or 14-year-old child going into cardiac arrest, that's a whole different ballgame. That's something you don't expect. She was in critical, critical condition. So as we pulled into the ER parking lot, we went ahead and shocked her right there. Okay, let's check her pulse. Any pulse? Nothing. Don't let me forget to get Mark something, okay? Hi. Hi. I'm Mrs. Smith. I'm here to see my daughter. All right, we got a weak pulse. Let's get her hooked up to the monitor. At Meridia Suburban Hospital, Dr. Arnold Feltoon was the EMS director. It's not very common for children to have primary heart problems. One of the things we would have to consider would be whether there was something more going on other than just a severe asthma attack. Okay. Is she breathing at all? We shouldn't be long. We shouldn't be too long at all. Yeah. We was just sitting back there, and you know, we heard cold blue, cold blue, and I said, God, we'd be here all day. I just felt it was somebody else, you know. I just knew it wasn't my daughter. She continued to experience arrhythmia. That's what required her to be electrically shocked to try to get the heart back to normal. Okay, check for pulse. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Feltoon. Are you uh, Dion's mother? Yes. The doctor came in, and he today? said, your daughter she just went into cardiac arrest. She had a heart attack? Well, the first thing I told him, I said, no, you got the wrong person. She came in for asthma, you know. And he talked about, they in there trying to breed her. <laughs> Nikki's younger sister, Diane, asked to see her. The nurse took me by my hand, and she took me in there. And I looked at my sister and she had tubes everywhere. She didn't look like herself at all. And that's when I like almost passed out. I was just crying and screaming and 
trying to make myself believe it wasn't true. As 14-year-old Nikki's condition deteriorated, she was taken to Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, where they had a special pediatric intensive care unit. Her mother joined her there. I wanted to grab her thing. It just hauled her. But I couldn't touch her. They wouldn't let me touch her. And I looked up, and then the screen went black. We need some help in here. No I think I just went crazy. And that's when they took me out, because she went into another... A, another arrest i just knew this was it this was it i'm not gonna see her no more i couldn't even hold her dr dan lebovitz took over nikki's care over the four to six hour period following her admission to the intensive care unit she had approximately 15 to 20 episodes of abnormal heart rhythms that all of which potentially could have led to her death we treat many many children with severe asthma and they don't do this so we had to find another cause. Had a number of times we reviewed very carefully with the mother what medications she was on regularly. At least a half dozen times. They told me they think that she had taken over it those. And I'm like, no, not Nikki. Nikki don't take no overdose. It's like, when did she do it? She didn't show no sign that she was going to do it. I was excited, like, Lord, I can go in there and see my baby. Your mom's here. I was waiting for her to make a sound. And I kept thinking, Lord, let's let her speak. She just looked straight at me and said, Mommy, hold me, please. And then I, I did exactly what she wanted me to do. I just held her. You know, and I held her, I squeezed her, and I'm shocked I didn't kill her then. I was holding her so tight. They said when I was in the hospital and I woke up, I told my head nurse that I had taken the overdose on purpose. It was a stupid thing that I did, but you learn from your mistakes. Fourteen months have passed since Nikki overdosed on her prescription medication. Both she and her mother, Terry Lynn, have gotten counseling. I was going through a rough divorce situation, and I was almost making Nikki the mom. I felt I was the only one at that time was able to take care of my mother and my sister, and I focused my attention on them and neglected to take care of myself. <laughs> we both had to do a lot of growing up, and we did. Now it's like we are at the road we're supposed to be mother-daughter role, and it's, it's great. <laughs> you know, we get along, we talk, we have fun, we fight. Since the incident, their counselor, Reverend Tanya Fields, has been very involved with the family. I believe that Nikki has learned that life is worth living, that there are people in the world who really care about her. She knows that she can pick up the phone and she can call someone and say, this is too heavy for me. I can't handle it. And it's okay. From the time when we were babies on up, my sister was always there for me. We've always had that sister-sister relationship, but it's gotten stronger, I know that. When something's bothering me, I've learned to say something to somebody, because I keep it in silence, it's going to drive me to do the same thing again. And that's not what I want to happen, because I've hurt too many people by doing that. I feel I'm very lucky. Just to have made it through 19 cardiac arrests is amazing. Most people do not make it out on one. I feel that it was a miracle that had taken place. Sometimes burdens are too heavy. You don't have to carry them all. Open up your heart, reach out your hand, and let someone help you. There are storms, there are struggles, but you can make it. You can make it. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911.
Step out of the car, please.